Vajrayana, Mantrayana, Tantrayana, Tantric Buddhism and Esoteric Buddhism are the various Buddhist traditions of Tantra and ''Secret Mantra'' which developed in medieval India and spread to Tibet, Bhutan, and East Asia. In Tibet, Buddhist Tantra is termed Vajrayana, while in China it is generally known as Tangmi Tang Chinese Tantrayana, or Mizong Miza Church of Tantrayana. In Pali it is known as Pyatsyana, and in Japan it is known as Mikkyo Mid Secret Teachings. Vajrayana is usually translated as diamond vehicle or thunderbolt vehicle, referring to the Vajra, a mythical weapon which is also used as a ritual implement. Founded by medieval Indian Mahasiddhas, Vajrayana subscribes to the literature known as the Buddhist Tantras. It includes practices that make use of mantras, dharanis, mudras, mandalas and the visualization of deities and Buddhas. According to Vajrayana scriptures, the term Vajrayana refers to one of three vehicles or routes to enlightenment, the other two being the Sravakayana also known as the Hinayana and Mahayana. History of Vajrayana Mahasiddha movement Tantric Buddhism can be traced back to groups of wandering yogis called Mahasiddhas great adepts. According to Reynolds 2007, the Mahasiddhas date to the medieval period in the northern Indian subcontinent 3 to 13 CEN. CE, and used methods that were radically different than those used in Buddhist monasteries including living in forests and caves and practiced meditation in charnel grounds similar to those practiced by Shaiva Kapalika ascetics. These yogic circles came together in tantric feasts often in sacred sites and places which included dancing, singing, sex rites and the ingestion of taboo substances like alcohol, urine, meat, etc. At least two of the Mahasiddhas given in the Buddhist literature are actually names for Shaiva Nath saints Gorakshanath and Matsyendranath who practiced Hatha Yoga. According to Schumann, a movement called Sahaja Siddhi developed in the 8th century in Bengal. It was dominated by long-haired, wandering Mahasiddhas who openly challenged and ridiculed the Buddhist establishment. The Mahasiddhas pursued siddhas, magical powers such as flight and extrasensory perception as well as liberation. Ronald M. Davidson states that Buddhist siddhas demonstrated the appropriation of an older sociological form the independent sage, magician, who lived in a liminal zone on the borders between fields and forests. Their rites involved the conjunction of sexual practices and Buddhist mandala visualization with ritual accoutrements made from parts of the human body, so that control may be exercised over the forces hindering the natural abilities of the siddha to manipulate the cosmos at will. At their most extreme, siddhas also represented a defensive position within the Buddhist tradition, adopted and sustained for the purpose of aggressive engagement with the medieval culture of public violence. They reinforced their reputations for personal sanctity with rumors of the magical manipulation of various flavors of demonic females Dakini, Yaksi, Yogini, cemetery ghouls Vetala, and other things that go bump in the night. Operating on the margins of both monasteries and polite society, some adopted the behaviors associated with ghosts Prata, Pisaka, not only as a religious praxis but also as an extension of their implied threats. Tantras Earlier Mahayana sutras already contain some elements which are emphasized in the tantras, such as mantras and dharani. The use of mantras and protective verses actually dates back to the Vedic period and the early Buddhist texts like the Pali Canon. The practice of visualization of Buddhas such as Amitabha is also seen in pre-tantra texts like the longer Sukhavadivyuha Sutra. There are other Mahayana sutras which contain proto-tantric material such as the Gandavyuha Sutra and the Dasapumika which might have served as a central source of visual imagery for tantric texts. Vajrayana developed a large corpus of texts called the Buddhist Tantras, some of which can be traced to at least the 7th century CE but might be older. The dating of the Tantras is a difficult, indeed an impossible task, according to David Snellgrove. Some of the earliest of these texts, Kriya Tantras such as the Manusri Mula Kalpa 6th century, focus on the use of mantras and dharanis for mostly worldly ends including curing illness, controlling the weather and generating wealth. The Tattvasamgraha Tantra, classed as a Yoga Tantra, 
is one of the first Buddhist tantras which focuses on liberation as opposed to worldly goals and in the Vajrasakara Tantra the concept of the five Buddha families is developed. Other early tantras include the Mahavarokana Tantra and the Guhyasamaja Tantra. The Guhyasamaja is a Mahayoga class of tantra, which features new forms of ritual practice considered left hand. Vamachara, such as the use of taboo substances like alcohol, sexual yoga, and charnel ground practices which evoke wrathful deities. Indeed, Ryujun Tajima divides the tantras into those which were a development of Mahayanist thought, and those formed in a rather popular mold toward the end of the 8th century and declining into the esotericism of the left. Mainly, the yogini tantras and later works associated with wandering antinomian yogis. Later monastic Vajrayana Buddhists reinterpreted and internalized these radically transgressive and taboo practices as metaphors and visualization exercises. Later tantras such as the Hevajra Tantra and the Chakrasamvara are classed as yogini tantras and represent the final form of development of Indian Buddhist tantras in the 9th and 10th centuries. The Kalachakra Tantra developed in the 10th century. It is farthest removed from the earlier Buddhist traditions, and incorporates concepts of messianism and astrology not present elsewhere in Buddhist literature. According to Ronald M. Davidson, the rise of Tantric Buddhism was a response to the feudal structure of Indian society in the early medieval period, ca. 500 CE, which saw kings being divinized as manifestations of gods. Likewise, Tantric yogis reconfigured their practice through the metaphor of being consecrated as the overlord of a mandala palace of divine vassals, an imperial metaphor symbolizing kingly fortresses and their political power. <laughs> Relationship to Savism The question of the origins of early Vajrayana has been taken up by various scholars. David Seifert Ruig has suggested by Buddhist Tantra employed various elements of a pan-Indian religious substrate which is not specifically Buddhist, Shaiva or Vaishnava. According to Alexis Sanderson, various classes of Vajrayana literature developed as a result of royal courts sponsoring both Buddhism and Savism. The relationship between the two systems can be seen in texts like the Manjusramulakalpa, which later came to be classified under Kriyatantra, and states that mantras taught in the Shaiva, Garuda and Vaishnava tantras will be effective if applied by Buddhists since they were all taught originally by Manjushri. Alexis Sanderson notes that the Vajrayana Yogini tantras draw extensively from Shaiva Bhairava tantras classified as Vidyapitha. Sanderson's comparison of them shows similarity in ritual procedures, style of observance, deities, mantras, mandalas, ritual dress, kapalika accoutrements, specialized terminology, secret gestures, and secret jargons. There is even direct borrowing of passages from seva texts." Sanderson gives numerous examples such as the Guyasiddhi of Padmavajra, a work associated with the Guyasamaja tradition, which prescribes acting as a Shaiva guru and initiating members into Saiva Siddhanta scriptures and mandalas. The Samvara Tantra texts adopted the Pitha list from the Shaiva text Tantrasadbhava, introducing a copying error where a deity was mistaken for a place. Ronald M. Davidson, meanwhile, argues that Sanderson's claims for direct influence from Shaiva Vidyapitha texts are problematic because, the chronology of the Vidyapitha tantras is by no means so well established, and that, the available evidence suggests that received Saiva tantras come into evidence sometime in the 9th to 10th centuries with their affirmation by scholars like Abhinavagupta. C. 1000 C. E. Davidson also notes that the list of pithas or sacred places are certainly not particularly Buddhist, nor are they uniquely Kapalika venues, despite their presence in lists employed by both traditions. Davidson further adds that like the Buddhists, the Shaiva tradition was also involved in the appropriation of Hindu and non-Hindu deities, texts and traditions, an example being village or tribal divinities like Tumbaru. Davidson adds that Buddhists and Kapalikas as well as other ascetics possibly Pasupadas mingled and discussed their paths at various pilgrimage places and that there were conversions between the different groups. Thus he concludes, the Buddhist Kapalika connection is more complex than a simple process of religious imitation and textual appropriation. There can be no question that the Buddhist Tantras were heavily influenced by Kapalika and other Saiva movements, but the influence was apparently mutual. 
Perhaps a more nuanced model would be that the various lines of transmission were locally flourishing and that in some areas they interacted, while in others they maintained concerted hostility. Thus the influence was both sustained and reciprocal, even in those places where Buddhist and Kapalika siddhas were in extreme antagonism. Davidson also argues for the influence of non-Brahmanical and outcast tribal religions and their feminine deities Parnasabari and Jangalai. Philosophical background According to Louis de la Vallée Poussin and Alex Wayman, the view of the Vajrayana is based on Mahayana Buddhist philosophy, mainly the Madhyamaka and Yogacara schools. The major difference seen by Vajrayana thinkers is Tantra's superiority due to being a faster vehicle to liberation containing many skillful methods of Tantric ritual. The importance of the theory of emptiness is central to the tantric view and practice. Buddhist emptiness sees the world as being fluid, without an ontological foundation or inherent existence but ultimately a fabric of constructions. Because of this, tantric practice such as self-visualization as the deity is seen as being no less real than everyday reality, but a process of transforming reality itself, including the practitioner's identity as the deity. As Stefan Bayer notes, in a universe where all events dissolve ontologically into emptiness, the touching of emptiness in the ritual is the re-creation of the world in actuality." The doctrine of Buddha nature, as outlined in the Ritnagatravabhaga of Asanga, was also an important theory which became the basis for tantric views. As explained by the tantric commentator Lilavajra, this "...intrinsic secret behind diverse manifestation," is the utmost secret and aim of tantra. According to Alex Wayman this Buddha embryo Tathagatagarbha is a non-dual self-originated wisdom jnana, an effortless fount of good qualities that resides in the mindstream but is obscured by discursive thought this doctrine is often associated with the idea of the inherent or natural luminosity skt prakriti prabhasvarasata t ad gsal gsems or purity of the mind prakriti parasuta Another fundamental theory of tantric practice is that of transformation. Negative mental factors such as desire, hatred, greed, pride are not rejected as in non-tantric Buddhism, but are used as part of the path. As noted by French Indologist Madeleine Biardo, tantric doctrine is an attempt to place kama, desire, in every meaning of the word, in the service of liberation. This view is outlined in the following quote from the Hevajra Tantra. Those things by which evil men are bound, others turn into means and gain thereby release from the bonds of existence. By passion the world is bound, by passion too it is released, but by heretical Buddhists this practice of reversals is not known. The Hevajra further states that, "...one knowing the nature of poison may dispel poison with poison." As Snellgrove notes, this idea is already present in Asanga's Mahayana Sutra Alamkara Karika and therefore it is possible that he was aware of tantric techniques, including sexual yoga. According to Buddhist Tantra there is no strict separation of the profane or samsara and the sacred or nirvana, rather they exist in a continuum. All individuals are seen as containing the seed of enlightenment within, which is covered over by defilements. Douglas Duckworth notes that Vajrayana sees Buddhahood not as something outside or an event in the future, but as imminently present. Indian Tantric Buddhist philosophers such as Buddhaguya, Vimalamitra, Ratnakarasanti, and Abhayakaragupta continued the tradition of Buddhist philosophy and adapted it to their commentaries on the major tantras. Abhayakaragupta's Vajravali is a key source in the theory and practice of tantric rituals. After monks such as Vajrabodhi and Subhakarasimha brought Tantra to Tang China 716 to 720, Tantric philosophy continued to be developed in Chinese and Japanese by thinkers such as Yi Xing and Kakai. Likewise in Tibet, Sakya Pandita as well as later thinkers like Longchunpa expanded on these philosophies in their Tantric commentaries and treatises. The status of the Tantric view continued to be debated in medieval Tibet. Tibetan Buddhist Rongzam Chokhi Zongpo held that the views of sutra such as Madhyamaka were inferior to that of Tantra, as Kapil notes, By now we have seen that Rongzam regards the views of the sutrayana as inferior to those of mantra, and he underscores his commitment to the purity of all phenomena by criticizing the Madhyamaka objectification of the authentic relative truth. 
Tsongkhapa on the other hand, held that there is no difference between Vajrayana and other forms of Mahayana in terms of Prajnaparamita perfection of insight itself, only that Vajrayana is a method which works faster. <laughs> Place within Buddhist tradition Various classifications are possible when distinguishing Vajrayana from the other Buddhist traditions. Vajrayana can be seen as a third yana, next to Hinayana and Mahayana. Vajrayana can be distinguished from the Sutrayana. The Sutrayana is the method of perfecting good qualities, where the Vajrayana is the method of taking the intended outcome of Buddhahood as the path. Vajrayana, belonging to the Mantrayana, can also be distinguished from the Paramitayana. According to this schema, Indian Mahayana revealed two vehicles yana or methods for attaining enlightenment, the method of the perfections and the method of mantra The paramitayana consists of the six or ten paramitas, of which the scriptures say that it takes three incalculable eons to lead one to Buddhahood. The Tantra literature, however, claims that the mantrayana leads one to Buddhahood in a single lifetime. According to the literature, the mantra is an easy path without the difficulties innate to the paramitayana. Mantrayana is sometimes portrayed as a method for those of inferior abilities. However the practitioner of the mantra still has to adhere to the vows of the bodhisattva. <laughs> <laughs> Characteristics of Vajrayana Goal The goal of spiritual practice within the Mahayana and Vajrayana traditions is to become a Samasambuddha fully awakened Buddha, those on this path are termed bodhisattvas. As with the Mahayana, motivation is a vital component of Vajrayana practice. The bodhisattva path is an integral part of the Vajrayana, which teaches that all practices are to be undertaken with the motivation to achieve Buddhahood for the benefit of all sentient beings. In the Sutrayana practice, a path of Mahayana, the path of the cause, is taken, whereby a practitioner starts with his or her potential Buddha nature and nurtures it to produce the fruit of Buddhahood. In the Vajrayana the path of the fruit is taken whereby the practitioner takes his or her innate Buddha nature as the means of practice. The premise is that since we innately have an enlightened mind, practicing seeing the world in terms of ultimate truth can help us to attain our full Buddha nature. Experiencing ultimate truth is said to be the purpose of all the various tantric techniques practiced in the Vajrayana. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Esoteric transmission. Vajrayana Buddhism is esoteric in the sense that the transmission of certain teachings only occurs directly from teacher to student during an empowerment abhisika and their practice requires initiation in a ritual space containing the mandala of the deity. Many techniques are also commonly said to be secret, but some Vajrayana teachers have responded that secrecy itself is not important and only a side effect of the reality that the techniques have no validity outside the teacher-student lineage. In order to engage in Vajrayana practice, a student should have received such an initiation or permission. If these techniques are not practiced properly, practitioners may harm themselves physically and mentally. In order to avoid these dangers, the practice is kept secret outside the teacher-student relationship. Secrecy and the commitment of the student to the Vajra Guru are aspects of the Samaya tib, damsig, or sacred bond. That protects both the practitioner and the integrity of the teachings. The secrecy of teachings was often protected through the use of elusive, indirect, symbolic and metaphorical language, twilight language which required interpretation and guidance from a teacher. The teachings may also be considered self-secret, meaning that even if they were to be told directly to a person, that person would not necessarily understand the teachings without proper context. In this way the teachings are secret. To the minds of those who are not following the path with more than a simple sense of curiosity, because of their role in giving access to the practices and guiding the student through them, the role of the guru, lama or vajracharya is indispensable in vajrayana. <laughs> Affirmation of the feminine, antinomian and taboo 
Some Vajrayana rituals include use of certain taboo substances, such as blood, semen, alcohol, and urine, as ritual offerings and sacraments, though these are often replaced with less taboo substances in their place, such as yogurt. Tantric feasts and initiations sometimes employed substances like human flesh, as noted by Kahaz Yogaratnamala. The use of these substances is related to the non dual nature of Buddhahood. Since the ultimate state is in some sense non-dual, a practitioner can approach that state by "...transcending attachment to dual categories such as pure and impure, permitted and forbidden." As the Guyasamaja Tantra states, "...the wise man who does not discriminate achieves Buddhahood." Vajrayana rituals also include sexual yoga, union with a physical consort as part of advanced practices. Some tantras go further. The Hevajra Tantra states you should kill living beings, speak lying words, take what is not given, consort with the women of others. While some of these statements were taken literally as part of ritual practice, others such as killing was interpreted in a metaphorical sense. In the Hevajra, killing is defined as developing concentration by killing the life breath of discursive thoughts. Likewise, while actual sexual union with a physical consort is practiced, it is also common to use a visualized mental consort. Alex Wayman points out that the symbolic meaning of tantric sexuality is ultimately rooted in bodhicitta and the bodhisattva's quest for enlightenment is likened to a lover seeking union with the mind of the Buddha. Judith Simmer Brown notes the importance of the psycho-physical experiences arising in sexual yoga, termed, great bliss, mahasuka. Bliss melts the conceptual mind, heightens sensory awareness, and opens the practitioner to the naked experience of the nature of mind. This tantric experience is not the same as ordinary self-gratifying sexual passion since it relies on tantric meditative methods using the subtle body and visualizations as well as the motivation for enlightenment. As the Hevajra Tantra says, This practice of sexual union with a consort is not taught for the sake of enjoyment, but for the examination of one's own thought, whether the mind is steady or waving. Feminine deities and forces are also increasingly prominent in Vajrayana. In the Yogini Tantras in particular, women and female figures are given high status as the embodiment of female deities such as the wild and nude Vajrayogini. The Kandamaharasana Tantra states, Women are heaven, women are the teaching dharma. Women indeed are the highest austerity tapas. Women are the Buddha, women are the Sangha. Women are the perfection of wisdom. Kandamaharasana Tantra v. 29-30 In India, there is evidence to show that women participated in tantric practice alongside men and were also teachers, adepts and authors of tantric texts. Vows and behavior Practitioners of the Vajrayana need to abide by various tantric vows or samaya of behavior. These are extensions of the rules of the Pratimaksa and Bodhisattva vows for the lower levels of tantra, and are taken during initiations into the empowerment for a particular Anatarayoga tantra. The special tantric vows vary depending on the specific mandala practice for which the initiation is received, and also depending on the level of initiation. Nagpas of the Nyingma school keep a special non-celibate ordination. A tantric guru, or teacher, is expected to keep his or her samaya vows in the same way as his students. Proper conduct is considered especially necessary for a qualified Vajrayana guru. For example, the ornament for the essence of Manjushrikirti states, Distance yourself from Vajra masters who are not keeping the three vows who keep on with a root downfall, who are miserly with the Dharma, and who engage in actions that should be forsaken. Those who worship them go to hell and so on as a result. <laughs> Tantra techniques While Vajrayana includes all of the traditional practices used in Mahayana Buddhism such as Samatha and Vipassana meditation and the Paramitas, it also includes a number of unique practices or skillful means Sanskrit, upaya, which are seen as more advanced and effective. Vajrayana is a system of lineages, whereby those who successfully receive an empowerment or sometimes called initiation permission to practice are seen to share in the mindstream of the realization of a particular skillful means of the Vajra master. 
Vajrayana teaches that the Vajrayana techniques provide an accelerated path to enlightenment which is faster than other paths. A central feature of tantric practice is the use of mantras, syllables, words, or a collection of syllables understood to have special powers and hence as a performative utterance used for a variety of ritual ends. In tantric meditation, mantric seed syllables are used during the ritual evocation of deities which are said to arise out of the uttered and visualized mantric syllables. After the deity has been established, heart mantras are visualized as part of the contemplation in different points of the deity's body. According to Alex Wayman, Buddhist esotericism is centered on what is known as the three mysteries or secrets. The tantric adept affiliates his body, speech, and mind with the body, speech, and mind of the Buddha through mudra, mantras, and samadhi, respectively. Padmavajra c. 7th century explains in his Tantroarthavatara commentary, the secret body, speech, and mind of the Tathagatas are Secret of body, whatever form is necessary to tame the living beings. Secret of speech, speech exactly appropriate to the lineage of the creature, as in the language of the yaksas, etc. Secret of mind, knowing all things as they really are. Deity Yoga The fundamental, defining practice of Buddhist Tantra is Deity Yoga, Devada yoga meditation on a yidam, or personal deity, which involves the recitation of mantras, prayers and visualization of the deity along with the associated mandala of the deity's pure land, with consorts and attendants. According to Tsongkhapa, deity yoga is what separates tantra from sutra practice. A key element of this practice involves the dissolution of the profane world and identification with a sacred reality. Because tantra makes use of a similitude of the resultant state of Buddhahood as the path, it is known as the effect vehicle or result vehicle, phalayana, which brings the effect to the path. In the highest yoga tantras and in the inner tantras this is usually done in two stages, the generation stage and the completion stage In the generation stage, one dissolves oneself in emptiness and meditates on the yidam, resulting in identification with this yidam. In the completion stage, the visualization of an identification with the yidam is dissolved in the realization of luminous emptiness. Ratnakarasanti describes the generation stage cultivation practice thus, a LL phenomenal appearance having arisen as mind, this very mind is understood to be produced by a mistake brontya, i.e. the appearance of an object where there is no object to be grasped, ascertaining that this is like a dream, in order to abandon this mistake, all appearances of objects that are blue and yellow and so on are abandoned or destroyed parir. then, the appearance of the world that is ascertained to be oneself is seen to be like the stainless sky on an autumn day at noon, appearanceless, unending sheer luminosity. This dissolution into emptiness is then followed by the visualization of the deity and re-emergence of the yogi as the deity. During the process of deity visualization, the deity is to be imaged as not solid or tangible, as empty yet apparent, with the character of a mirage or a rainbow. This visualization is to be combined with divine pride, which is the thought that one is oneself the deity being visualized. Divine pride is different from common pride because it is based on compassion for others and on an understanding of emptiness. Some practices associated with the completion stage make use of an energetic system of human psychophysiology composed of what is termed as energy channels (RTSA), winds or currents (our lung), and drops or charged particles (thigla). These subtle body energies are seen as mounts for consciousness, the physical component of awareness. They are said to converge at certain points along the spinal column called chakras. Some practices which make use of this system include trul core and tumo. Other practices Another form of Vajrayana practice are certain meditative techniques associated with Mahamudra and Dzogchen often termed formless practices. These techniques do not rely on yidam visualization but on direct pointing out instruction from a master and are seen as the most advanced forms. In Tibetan Buddhism, advanced practices like deity yoga and the formless practices are usually preceded by or coupled with preliminary practices, 
Called Nandra, which includes prostrations and recitations of the 100 syllable mantra. Another distinctive feature of Tantric Buddhism is its unique rituals, which are used as a substitute or alternative for the earlier abstract meditations. Template, itation not found, they include death rituals, see foa, tantric feasts, Ganachakra, and Homa fire ritual, common in East Asian Tantric Buddhism. Other unique practices in Tantric Buddhism include dream yoga, the yoga of the intermediate state at death or bardo and chad, in which the yogi ceremonially offers their body to be eaten by Tantric deities. <laughs> <laughs> Symbols and imagery The Vajrayana uses a rich variety of symbols, terms and images which have multiple meanings according to a complex system of analogical thinking. In Vajrayana, symbols and terms are multivalent, reflecting the microcosm and the macrocosm as in the phrase, as without, so within, yatha bayam tatha from Abhayakaraguptas Nispanayogavali. The Sanskrit term, Vajra, denoted the thunderbolt, a legendary weapon and divine attribute that was made from an adamantine, or indestructible, substance and which could therefore pierce and penetrate any obstacle or obfuscation. It is the weapon of choice of Indra, the king of the Devas. As a secondary meaning, Vajra symbolizes the ultimate nature of things which is described in the Tantras as translucent, pure and radiant, but also indestructible and indivisible. It is also symbolic of the power of tantric methods to achieve its goals. A vajra is also a scepter like ritual object, standard Tibetan, dorje, which has a sphere and sometimes a gankiel at its center, and a variable number of spokes, three, five, or nine at each end, depending on the sadhana, enfolding either end of the rod. The vajra is often traditionally employed in tantric rituals in combination with the bell or ganta. Symbolically, the vajra may represent method as well as great bliss, and the bell stands for wisdom, specifically the wisdom realizing emptiness. The union of the two sets of spokes at the center of the wheel is said to symbolize the unity of wisdom prajna and compassion karuna, as well as the sexual union of male and female deities. Topic. Imagery and ritual in deity yoga Representations of the deity, such as statues murti, paintings thangka, or mandala, are often employed as an aid to visualization, in deity yoga. The use of visual aids, particularly microcosmic, macrocosmic diagrams, known as mandalas, is another unique feature of Buddhist Tantra. Mandalas are symbolic depictions of the sacred space of the awakened Buddhas and Bodhisattvas as well as of the inner workings of the human person. The macrocosmic symbolism of the mandala then, also represents the forces of the human body. The explanatory tantra of the Guhyasamaja Tantra, the Vajramala, states, "...the body becomes a palace, the hallowed basis of all the Buddhas." Mandalas are also sacred enclosures, sacred architecture that house and contain the uncontainable essence of a central deity or yidam and their retinue. In the book The World of Tibetan Buddhism, the Dalai Lama describes mandalas thus, This is the celestial mansion, the pure residence of the deity. The five Tathagatas or five Buddhas, along with the figure of the Adi Buddha, are central to many Vajrayana mandalas as they represent the five wisdoms which are the five primary aspects of primordial wisdom or Buddha nature. All ritual in Vajrayana practice can be seen as aiding in this process of visualization and identification. The practitioner can use various hand implements such as a vajra, bell, hand drum damaru, or a ritual dagger firba, but also ritual hand gestures mudras can be made, special chanting techniques can be used, and in elaborate offering rituals or initiations, many more ritual implements and tools are used, each with an elaborate symbolic meaning to create a special environment for practice. Vajrayana has thus become a major inspiration in traditional Tibetan art. Topic. Vajrayana textual tradition The Vajrayana tradition has developed an extended body of texts, though we do not know precisely at present just how many Indian Tantric Buddhist texts survive today in the language in which they were written, their number is certainly over 1,500, I suspect indeed over 2,000. 
A large part of this body of texts has also been translated into Tibetan, and a smaller part into Chinese. Aside from these, there are perhaps another 2,000 or more works that are known today only from such translations. We can be certain as well that many others are lost to us forever, in whatever form. Of the texts that survive a very small proportion has been published, an almost insignificant percentage has been edited or translated reliably. <laughs> <laughs> Literary characteristics Vajrayana texts exhibit a wide range of literary characteristics—usually a mix of verse and prose, almost always in a Sanskrit that transgresses frequently against classical norms of grammar and usage", although also occasionally in various Middle Indic dialects or elegant classical Sanskrit. <laughs> Dunhuang manuscripts The Dunhuang manuscripts also contain Tibetan Tantric manuscripts. Dalton and Sheikh 2007, revised, provide an excellent online catalogue listing 350 Tibetan Tantric manuscripts from Dunhuang in the Stein Collection of the British Library which is currently fully accessible online in discrete digitised manuscripts. With the Wiley transcription of the manuscripts they are to be made discoverable online in the future. These 350 texts are just a small portion of the vast cache of the Dunhuang manuscripts. Schools of Vajrayana Although there is historical evidence for Vajrayana Buddhism in Southeast Asia and elsewhere see History of Vajrayana above, today the Vajrayana exists primarily in the form of the two major traditions of Tibetan Buddhism and Japanese esoteric Buddhism in Japan known as Shingon literally, true speech i.e. mantra, with a handful of minor subschools utilizing lesser amounts of esoteric or tantric materials. The distinction between traditions is not always rigid. For example, the tantra sections of the Tibetan Buddhist canon of texts sometimes include material not usually thought of as tantric outside the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, such as the Heart Sutra and even versions of some material found in the Pali canon. Tibetan Buddhism Vajrayana Buddhism was established in Tibet in the 8th century when Santaraksita was brought to Tibet from India at the instigation of the Dharma king Trisong Detson, some time before 767. Tibetan Buddhism reflects the later stages of Indian Tantric Buddhist developments, including the Yogini Tantras, translated into the Tibetan language. It also includes native Tibetan developments, such as the Tulku system, New Sadhana texts, Tibetan scholastic works, Dzogchen literature and Terma literature. The Tibetan Buddhist schools, based on the lineages and textual traditions of the Kangyur and Tengyur of Tibet, are found in Tibet, Bhutan, northern India, Nepal, southwestern and northern China, Mongolia and various constituent republics of Russia that are adjacent to the area, such as Amur Oblast, Buryasha, Chita Oblast, the Tuva Republic and Khabarovsk Krai. Tibetan Buddhism is also the main religion in Kalmykia. Nepalese Nuar Buddhism Nuar Buddhism is practiced by Nuars in Nepal. It is the only form of Vajrayana Buddhism in which the scriptures are written in Sanskrit and this tradition has preserved many Vajrayana texts in this language. Its priests do not follow celibacy and are called Vajracharya literally, diamond thunderbolt carriers. Tantric Theravada Tantric Theravada or esoteric Southern Buddhism is a term for esoteric forms of Buddhism from Southeast Asia, where Theravada Buddhism is dominant. The monks of the Sri Lankan, Abhyagiri Vihara once practiced forms of Tantra which were popular in the island. Another tradition of this type was Ari Buddhism, which was common in Burma. The Tantric Buddhist Yogavacara tradition was a major Buddhist tradition in Cambodia, Laos and Thailand well into the modern era. This form of Buddhism declined after the rise of Southeast Asian Buddhist modernism. <inaudible> <inaudible> Indonesian esoteric Buddhism 
Indonesian esoteric Buddhism refers to the traditions of esoteric Buddhism found in the Indonesian islands of Java and Sumatra before the rise and dominance of Islam in the region 13 to 16 th centuries. The Buddhist empire of Srivijaya CE to CE was a major center of esoteric Buddhist learning which drew Chinese monks such as Yijing and Indian scholars like Atisa. The temple complex at Borobudur in central Java, built by the Shailendra dynasty also reflects strong tantric or at least proto-tantric influences, particularly of the cult of Vairokana. <laughs> Philippine esoteric Buddhism Although no written record exists about early Buddhism in the Philippines, the recent archaeological discoveries and the few scant references in the other nations' historical records can tell, however, about the existence of Buddhism from the 9th century onward in the islands. The Philippines's archaeological finds include a few of Buddhist artifacts, most of them dated to the 9th century. The artifacts reflect the iconography of the Srivijaya's Vajrayana Buddhism and its influences on the Philippines's early states. The artifacts' distinct features point to their production in the islands and hint at the artisans' or goldsmiths' knowledge of Buddhist culture and Buddhist literature because the artisans have made these unique works of Buddhist art. The artifacts imply also the presence of Buddhist believers in the places where these artifacts turned up. These places extended from the Agusan Surigao area in Mindanao Island to Cebu, Palawan, and Luzon Islands. Hence, Vajrayana Buddhism must have spread far and wide throughout the archipelago and Vajrayana Buddhism must have become the religion of the majority of the inhabitants in the islands. The early states trade contacts with the neighboring empires and polities like in Sumatra, Srivijaya and Majapahit Empire in Java long before or in the 9th century must have served as the conduit for introducing Vajrayana Buddhism to the islands. <laughs> Chinese esoteric Buddhism Esoteric and Tantric teachings followed the same route into northern China as Buddhism itself, arriving via the Silk Road and Southeast Asian maritime trade routes sometime during the first half of the 7th century, during the Tang dynasty and received sanction from the emperors of the Tang dynasty. During this time, three great masters came from India to China, Subhakarasimha, Vajrabodhi, and Imogavajra who translated key texts and founded the Junyan true word, mantra, tradition. Junyan was also brought to Japan as Shingon during this period. This tradition focused on tantras like the Mahavarokana Tantra, and unlike Tibetan Buddhism, does not employ the antinomian and radical tantrism of the Anattariyoga Tantras. The prestige of this tradition influenced other schools of Chinese Buddhism such as Chan and Tiantai to adopt esoteric practices. During the Yuan dynasty, the Mongol emperors made Tibetan Buddhism the official religion of China, and Tibetan lamas were given patronage at the court. Imperial support of Tibetan Vajrayana continued into the Ming and Qing dynasties. Another form of esoteric Buddhism in China is Azaliism, which is practiced among the Bai people of China. <laughs> Korean Milgyo Esoteric Buddhist practices known as Milgyo, Mi Jiao and texts arrived in Korea during the initial introduction of Buddhism to the region in 372 CE. Esoteric Buddhism was supported by the royalty of both Unified Silla (668–935) and Goryeo Dynasty (918–1392). During the Goryeo dynasty esoteric practices were common within large sects like the Seon school, and the Hwaeom school as well as smaller esoteric sects like the Sinan and Chongji schools. During the era of the Mongol occupation 1251 -1350s, Tibetan Buddhism also existed in Korea though it never gained a foothold there. During the Joseon dynasty, esoteric Buddhist schools were forced to merge with the Sun and Kyo schools, becoming the ritual specialists. With the decline of Buddhism in Korea, esoteric Buddhism mostly died out, save for a few traces in the rituals of the Jogi order and Taega order. There are two esoteric Buddhist schools in modern Korea, the Shinan Gen Yan and the Jingik order. Gen According to Henrik H. Sorensen, they have absolutely no historical link with the Korean Buddhist tradition per se but are late constructs based in large measures on Japanese Shingon Buddhism. Japan <laughs> 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 
Topic: <laughs> Shingon Buddhism. The Shingon school is found in Japan and includes practices known in Japan as mikio, esoteric or mystery teaching, which are similar in concept to those in Vajrayana Buddhism. The lineage for Shingon Buddhism differs from that of Tibetan Vajrayana, having emerged from India during the 9th–11th centuries in the Pala dynasty and Central Asia via China and is based on earlier versions of the Indian texts than the Tibetan lineage. Shingon shares material with Tibetan Buddhism such as the esoteric sutras called tantras in Tibetan Buddhism and mandalas, but the actual practices are not related. The primary texts of Shingon Buddhism are the Mahavarokana Sutra and Vajrasakara Sutra. The founder of Shingon Buddhism was Kakai, a Japanese monk who studied in China in the 9th century during the Tang dynasty and brought back Vajrayana scriptures, techniques and mandalas then popular in China. The school mostly died out or was merged into other schools in China towards the end of the Tang dynasty but flourished in Japan. Shingon is one of the few remaining branches of Buddhism in the world that continues to use the Siddham script of the Sanskrit language. Topic. Tendai Buddhism Although the Tendai school in China and Japan does employ some esoteric practices, these rituals came to be considered of equal importance with the exoteric teachings of the Lotus Sutra. By chanting mantras, maintaining mudras, or practicing certain forms of meditation, Tendai maintains that one is able to understand sense experiences as taught by the Buddha, have faith that one is innately an enlightened being, and that one can attain enlightenment within the current lifetime. <laughs> Shugendo Shugendo was founded in 7th century Japan by the ascetic N. no Gyoja, based on the Queen's Peacock Sutra. With its origins in the solitary Hajiri back in the 7th century, Shugendo evolved as a sort of amalgamation between esoteric Buddhism, Shinto and several other religious influences including Taoism. Buddhism and Shinto were amalgamated in the Shinbutsu Shugo, and Kakai's syncretic religion held wide sway up until the end of the Edo period, coexisting with Shinto elements within Shugenduan 1613 during the Edo period. The Tokugawa Shogunate issued a regulation obliging Shugendo temples to belong to either Shingon or Tendai temples. During the Meiji Restoration, when Shinto was declared an independent state religion separate from Buddhism, Shugendo was banned as a superstition not fit for a new, enlightened Japan. Some Shugendo temples converted themselves into various officially approved Shinto denominations. In modern times, Shugendo is practiced mainly by Tendai and Shingon sects, retaining an influence on modern Japanese religion and culture. <laughs> <laughs> Academic study difficulties Serious Vajrayana academic study in the Western world is in early stages due to the following obstacles. Although a large number of tantric scriptures are extant, they have not been formally ordered or systematized. Due to the esoteric initiatory nature of the tradition, many practitioners will not divulge information or sources of their information. As with many different subjects, it must be studied in context and with a long history spanning many different cultures. Ritual as well as doctrine need to be investigated. Buddhist tantric practice are categorized as secret practice. This is to avoid misinformed people from harmfully misusing the practices. A method to keep this secrecy is that tantric initiation is required from a master before any instructions can be received about the actual practice. During the initiation procedure in the highest class of tantra, such as the Kala Chakra, students must take the tantric vows which commit them to such secrecy. Explaining general Tantra theory in a scholarly manner, not sufficient for practice, is likewise not a root downfall. Nevertheless, it weakens the effectiveness of our Tantric practice. <laughs> Terminology The terminology associated with Vajrayana Buddhism can be confusing. Most of the terms originated in the Sanskrit language of Tantric Indian Buddhism and may have passed through other cultures, notably those of Japan and Tibet, before translation for the modern reader. Further complications arise as seemingly equivalent terms can have subtle variations in use and meaning according to context, the time and place of use. A third problem is that the Vajrayana texts employ the Tantric tradition of twilight language, a means of instruction that is deliberately coded. 
These obscure teaching methods relying on symbolism as well as synonym, metaphor and word association add to the difficulties faced by those attempting to understand Vajrayana Buddhism. In the Vajrayana tradition, now preserved mainly in Tibetan lineages, it has long been recognized that certain important teachings are expressed in a form of secret symbolic language known as Samdhyabhasa, twilight language. Mudras and mantras, mandalas and kakras, those mysterious devices and diagrams that were so much in vogue in the pseudo-Buddhist hippie culture of the 1960s, were all examples of twilight language. The term Tantric Buddhism was not one originally used by those who practiced it. As scholar Isabel Onians explains, Tantric Buddhism is not the transcription of a native term, but a rather modern coinage, if not totally occidental. For the equivalent Sanskrit Tantrika is found, but not in Buddhist texts. Tantrika is a term denoting someone who follows the teachings of scriptures known as Tantras, but only in Savism, not Buddhism. Tantric Buddhism is a name for a phenomenon which calls itself, in Sanskrit, Mantranaya, Vajrayana, Mantrayana or Mantramahayana and apparently never Tantrayana. Its practitioners are known as mantrans, yogis, or sadakas. Thus, our use of the anglicized adjective tantric for the Buddhist religion taught in tantras is not native to the tradition, but is a borrowed term which serves its purpose. See also <laughs> <laughs> Notes <laughs>